Today's Thanksgiving. It also happens to be the day on the Buddhist calendar where the Buddha gave his discourse on breath meditation. So let's put the two themes together. Gratitude to the Buddha for having found that you could gain awakening by something so simple as watching your breath. And that's not the only good thing that comes from watching the breath. As the, as the Buddha points out, there are many stages of concentration you can develop. It provides a comfortable dwelling place for the mind in the present moment. The body benefits as you focus on the breath in the way that he recommended. And stop and think, is this something you would have thought up on your own? It's good to remember we've got these teachings that we owe to with the exploration of other people. People like the Buddha who put his life on the line trying to find a true happiness. He tried various ways. Studying with other teachers, realized that their teachings didn't lead to anything deathless. And that was what he wanted, was a deathless happiness. And that's something to be grateful to as well. He stretched our ideas of what human beings are capable of. He saw that everybody was looking for happiness in things that would eventually age, grow ill, and die. They themselves would age, grow ill, and die. What would be left? What was noble about that kind of search, he said. The only noble search in his eyes was one that would lead to something that was free from aging, free from illness, free from death. And so he kept that as a standard. As he said, one of the secrets, you might say, of his awakening, or the key elements in his awakening, was his unwillingness to settle for second best, an unwillingness to be content, as he said, with skillful qualities. If he felt that there was something that was possibly even more skillful, he'd go for it. So he started with two teachers. Their teachings didn't satisfy him. He subjected himself to six years of austerities, extreme austerities. That didn't get the results he wanted. Then he remembered that when he was a child he'd been sitting under a tree while his father was plowing, a phrase that the later commentaries had to deal with because they had the belief that the Buddha's father was a king. The idea of a king plowing didn't sound right, except that he might plow at a royal ceremony at the beginning of the rainy season, the beginning of the planting season. At any rate, with a young prince or the young Buddha-to-be was sitting under a tree while his father was plowing, he got into a state of concentration, which he later recognized as the first jhana, the first level of right concentration. And the question came to him, could that be the way? And something inside and said yes. And so he started taking food again so he'd have the strength to get into that concentration. And then on the night of his awakening, he sat down in the Bodhi tree and focused on his breath as a way of stilling the mind. So again, why he thought of that, we don't really know. But it's something to be grateful for, the fact that he was able to find this path, something so simple, something so accessible to all beings, all human beings. And he pursued it as far as he could go, and then he taught us how to do it. So it's something to be grateful for. And the best way is to show our gratitude, of course, is to put it into practice. He went to all that trouble to find the way to share to others. Not so they would bow down to him, but so they would actually put it into practice and gain the results. As John Mahabha once said, the Buddha was not interested in ceremonies. He was more interested in realities. He wanted people to find the reality of the deathless. So this is our way of showing gratitude. And it's good to keep this in mind, that without the Buddha's teachings we wouldn't have this method. It's very unlikely that any of us would have found it on our own or that we would have had the courage to pursue it that far. So the method is available. We have people who have followed this method ahead of us and guaranteed that, yes, it does give the promised results. So that's a lot of the 
ground clearing has been done for us. So let's focus on our breath with a sense of gratitude that we've got this way and it is so available. And whatever difficulties it may involve, they're very minor compared to the difficulties, say, that the Buddha faced. Or the many people who had to rediscover the Buddha's teachings over time. We've got it right here. So what does the Buddha tell us to do with it? In the beginning he says, use your discernment, discern the difference between long and short breathing. Something very simple. And John Lee would say, you can discern other differences as well. Long, short, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow. And find the breath that's right for you, that the mind can settle down with. As the Buddha said, this method leads to states of strong concentration where there's a sense of well-being, even a sense of rapture. So what kind of breathing would give rise to well-being? What kind of breathing would give rise to rapture? We'll focus on that, just finding that. There's a lot that's not mentioned in the instructions. It gives you the idea of what kind of questions to ask yourself. So how do you play with the breath without squeezing it too much, without forcing it too much, so that it does change into a breath that's really nice? Part of it depends on just getting the mind very still and trying to be with the breath all the way in, all the way out, like a thread of silk that your finger follows without getting off the thread. Just keep following, 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 all the way in, all the way out. That smooths it out. And the remaining steps, the Buddha says, are trainings. After you've discerned the differences of the breath, you train yourself to breathe in certain ways. For instance, he says you train to breathe sensitive to the whole body. You try to spread your range of awareness. from one spot so that it covers the entire body, since the breathing process as a whole body process. That fits in with the descriptions of right concentration, where the, the Buddha says that you gain a sense of ease, a sense of rapture, and then you spread it through the body. You let it permeate through the body. The image he gives is of a bathman. Back in those days, they didn't have soap. Instead, they had a kind of a powder, powdered soap which you would mix with water and it would turn into like a lump of dough, and then you would rub that over your body. And so you have to knead the water into that lump of soap dough, just the way you knead the water into dough for making bread. So there's an active element, and once there's the ease and well-being that you work with it, again, have learning how to work with ease and well-being, so that it does spread through the body. That requires some skill. And if you push it too hard or squeeze it too hard, it's not going to be ease and well-being anymore. You have to give it space to spread on its own. Open up any of the energy channels in the body that you can sense that seem to be tight. If you can't think in terms of energy channels, think in terms of the muscles around the, the blood vessels, the muscles in the tiniest, tiniest parts of the body. Think of them all opening up. So whatever energy can flow, whatever energy there is, can flow through them. And then the Buddha says you breathe in such a way as to calm what he calls bodily fabrication. I was reading a piece recently questioning the, the standard translation of bodily fabrication, which is the breath. Saying, well, why would the Buddha introduce a technical term here? Well. Part of the reason we're doing breath meditation is because we're trying to develop both calm and insight. And insight requires seeing things in terms of fabrication. So the breath is something that fabricates your sense of the body. In fact, it's the primary thing that fabricates your sense of the body. Without it, you wouldn't sense the body at all. You'd be dead. The body would be dead. The fact that we breathe, that's the element through which we sense the other elements in the body. So how do you calm it? Usually the Buddha says when you calm things down, 
in the mind. First you try to develop a sense of rapture, a sense of fullness. In other words, you don't beat things down and make them still. It's just like trying to get a dog to be still. You don't beat the dog to be still. You give it food. And when it's had food, it'll lie down and rest. So in the same way, you've got to feed the mind well with a sense of rapture. The Pali word pitti can also mean a sense of refreshment. You refresh the mind, give it energy. So breathe in whatever way gives energy. And once there is that sense of energy, think of it spreading through the body. Sometimes it'll spread on its own. Sometimes it'll do weird things to your sense of the body, distorting your sense of the dimensions of the body or the size of the body. Just sit through those distortions. Don't get involved with them. It's a sign that your awareness is trying to settle in to an area that it's not all that familiar with. The rapture gives you energy, and then when it's done its job, it'll start, start to subside. Or if you find that it's oppressive, you can think of it flowing out the palms of your hands, flowing out the soles of your feet, flowing out your eyes. Or if it feels gross and it gets tiresome, then you can tune your mind into a more refined level of sensitivity, kind of flying under the radar. And things will calm down, calm down. There's a passage where the Buddha says that total calming of bodily fabrication comes in the fourth jhana, i.e. when your breath stops. Again, you don't stop it by forcing it to stop. You feed the body with good breath energy, you try to connect all the different energy channels so everything flows very smoothly and very quickly from one part of the body to the other. So if there's any need for breath energy in one part of the body, someplace else in the body where there's a little bit of excess, it'll flow right there. In other words, you don't have to bring energy in from outside. The energy in the body is already enough. Just get it connected. You find that your need to breathe with the in and out breathing just gets calmer and calmer. The need grows less and less. And eventually you get there to the point where the body is very still. The mind is very still. Your awareness fills the body. And there you are, right concentration all the way through. And that's just the first four steps in the Buddha's 16-step plan. But it's enough to get you started. So that remark I mentioned the other night where Stephen Colbert said, what is this with Buddhism? You wrap yourself in a cloth, you go sit under a tree, and you breathe. Well, those of us who do it realize, okay, there's a lot to learn here, and a lot to be gained. We have a lot to be grateful for that the Buddha and his discovered this way to awakening. And even even if we don't go all the way to awaken, we found a way to calm the mind down. Give it give it a sense of being at home in the body. So it can gain strength and a sense of inner nourishment. So it can find some peace, it can put some of its burdens down, even if not forever, at least put them down at least temporarily. So it can straighten itself out. At the same time, as you're working in this issue of bodily fabrication, as you're calming it down, you learn a lot about how the mind relates to the body, and the body relates to the mind. And that's the beginning of the insight that will take you beyond just ordinary resting into a dimension that really is deathless. And this in this fourth jhana where you are when the mind settles down to the point where the breath really does stop without being forced. It was from the fourth jhana that the Buddha was able to gain the insight that led to awakening. So you're right here where the Buddha was sitting. You're sitting where the Buddha was sitting. You begin to think in terms of fabrication. What are your intentions doing to shape the breath? How do those intentions shape your sense of the body? How does that happen? The 
this is a good place to answer those questions. So we can benefit from the Buddha's teachings, his kindness in having shared these teachings, and benefit from his courage in having gone out to find the teachings to begin with. As we keep doing this again and again and again, trying our best, that's how we show our gratitude for all that the Buddha and the noble disciples have done for us.